morning everybody and uh, welcome to this lecture of the first of two lectures on generative adversarial networks our lecturer for the topic is going to be ben streiner you have all heard severally of him uh, during the course i have mentioned him several times ben has done this particular uh, topic every semester since the, we began running the course and he's an expert on the subject so i am glad to turn this over to ben ben the floor is yours Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for the uh, wonderful introduction, as always, Biksha. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Um, definitely feel free to unmute and talk, or you can uh, put something into chat, and hopefully I can see the chat window. Yes, I have the chat window open as well, so if you want to type questions there, feel free. But um, anyways, I'm excited to introduce everybody to Generative Adversarial Networks, GANs, they are super cool. They are relatively new. One of the, the hottest topics for a bunch of years, still producing amazing results. And um, you'll about to see why. So let me see if the advance works. Ah, there we go. So in terms of what we're gonna cover today, um, just a little bit of motivation, what we're trying to do and what generative and discriminative models are how these relate to VAEs, and we're gonna, then we're gonna uh, dive into GANs themselves, what the math looks like. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to evaluate them and um, produce metrics. And then we'll go through a couple different variations of GANs to do more advanced, um, advanced types of distributions. So anyways, uh, GANs are generative models. And we're gonna talk about kind of what they are. And next week, we are gonna be talking about how to get them to work correctly in practice. So the, the way I've been dividing this up is the first week, why are they so cool? What do they do? What do we use them for? How can you do cool things with them? Second week, why is it really hard to train? And how do we um, do all these tips and tricks that make them actually usable in the kind of nitty gritty of the situation? Anyways, our goal is to generate data from an unlabeled distribution. So let's say you're given images, you want to produce many more images that are from the same distribution. Given music, you want to produce more music. Given text, you want to produce more text. That is to learn what a face looks like and to generalize and be able to produce new faces that don't exist and produce things that are uh, full, of the, um, full of the observer. So the real goal is for your network to produce images of faces that the average person says that looks like a normal face and you say, ha ha, that's no one's face. That person doesn't exist. I pulled that out of my model. That would be our, our goal here. Um, so great strides in recent years. We'll start by just seeing what it does and then talk about how to do it. So the original paper was on very simple data sets. You might recognize some of these. Um, there's MNIST, there's CIFAR, and you get these kind of blurry images, but it starts to reproduce uh, what the data set looks like. So these are screenshots from the original 2014 paper when this first came out. And on the right, you see real data, like the kind of stuff that's in your data set. And the rest of the data is stuff that the model was able to produce by learning to generalize. Um, so that's back in 2014. And if you look at kind of a timeline from 2014 to 2018, uh, I mean, the, the images speak for themselves. The um, the resolution has gotten much higher, the quality has gotten much higher, much better to train, obviously using many more GPUs than the original models were, um, and a lot more data too. But um, all the tips and techniques that we will go through in the second lecture allow you to take kind of the general framework, which came out in 2014, and get it to actually produce things that look like these 2018 models. So the, the faces you see, none of these are real people. These are just models that looked at a bunch of celebrity pictures and then started making photos that look like celebrities. And that's the power of a GAN. Um, most of the research you will see is in um, images because they're kind of simple. They're easy to work with. Everything's kind of cropped to the same size. Don't really worry about things, but it does work with audio, does work with text, works with really um, any domain you want it to. It just harder with some than with others for uh, engineering reasons more than anything else. <coughs> um, here are some examples of large scale images that have been produced. Um, 
early GAN results were on 28 by 28 pixels, 32 by 32. Um, now people are producing 512 by 512, very high resolution novel photos of dogs, pasta, mushrooms, everything that does not really exist in the database, but it's able to reproduce all kinds of incredible things. And it also is not simply memorizing photos. If you look through the test data set, you will not see any images that match these images. They are completely new and different positions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the interesting things that this allows you to do is not just generate data. When you have a generative model, that means you understand what the data is structured like. So for example, you can use a GAN to take a person's face and make them look angry or happy or fearful. So you can uh, use it not just for generating faces, but for modifying faces, for uh, understanding different um, aspects of faces and modifying them. Um, progressive growing of GANs was a big paper with very, very high quality results of, you know, celebrities that are, are non-existent. And uh, it can also be used for image translation. So we'll see some examples of doing things like you can change the weather. You can take a photo and say, what would this photo look like if it was raining, if it was night out, if it was winter? And the GAN is able to know what adding snow or removing snow looks like. So really powerful, lots of cool stuff it can do. Um, sounds like a fun thing to work with, hopefully. Hopefully everyone's excited to see how to actually do this and make it work. Um, so. Generative versus discriminative networks. Uh, what we're doing is we're learning a generative model. And discriminative networks, um, you really capture distribution. Generative networks, you're trying to reproduce the distribution. So P of Y given X, that is a conditional distribution. You're learning what labels Y go for what inputs X. If you were learning the generative model of that, you'd actually be learning the joint distribution of X and Y. And that gives you a full understanding of what does X look like? What does Y look like? And from the joint distribution, um, you know that you can calculate Y given X or X given Y by marginalizing, by doing manipulations from the joint distribution, but you can't recover all of that data from the conditional distribution. So it's important to understand that the joint distribution is more complicated and captures much more data than just the conditional distribution. And I think that makes sense. Um, if you just try to learn what label an image is, one through 10, you have a very simple rule. But if you actually want to be able to reproduce images and their labels, then you have to learn many more complicated things. Some pixels you might be able to ignore for inference. You still have to generate those pixels when you're trying to generate data. So in general, generative tends to be a harder problem. Um, and that allows you to recover the original and it allows you to cover the, um, the conditional distribution, which you would traditionally be training, um, but it learns many more things as well. So in some situations, it can be too hard. Some situations, it actually provides more regularization. Um, so one of the older takes on this was that you really should not try to solve a more general problem. A uh, kind of traditional viewpoint is that if you want to learn to label images, you should learn a model that labels images. If you want to learn to label images, why would you learn a model that generates images? That doesn't make sense. That sounds more complicated. Why would you do that? And that is correct if you have infinite amounts of data. If you have infinite amounts of data, if you're trying to go from images to labels, just train a network that goes from images to labels, put all the data into it, you're done, it's, it's that easy. But when you are building a generative model, you are learning many more complicated things about the data that can actually um, lead to better generalization and a deeper understanding. So what we do tend to see is that these generative models will um, extract relevant features and build these deeper understandings of the data and can sometimes give you better results on even labeling problems where you might not want to be using or maybe not want, but where you might not even think a generative model would apply or be a great idea. You are learning a deeper understanding, you're extracting deep latent features and you can actually get better generalization. Um, 
This also brings us to implicit versus explicit distribution modeling, somewhat related topic. Our GANs are implicit distributions. So what our GANs are going to do is they're going to learn to generate samples from the distribution you want. I want to learn about faces. Faces are a distribution over a space of pixels that is whatever size. And that's a very large, complicated distribution. When you learn a GAN, you don't know what the final distribution of faces is. I can't tell you the likelihood of a given face, but I can generate a bunch of faces that are reasonable from the distribution. Um, that happens, and you can see why one might be harder or it might be easier. So when you do an implicit distribution, you are not normalizing over the distribution space. I can tell you here are a bunch of images, but I don't have to say here are all the possible images divided by the total number of images because it's a big space and that's hard to do. Um, so in some sense, explicit modeling can capture um, the data directly, but implicit modeling can be much easier to learn when you can't actually learn the explicit. Um, what you will refer to this as in some more uh, uh, deep, deeper into the like ML curriculum and the math curriculum, probability curriculum is just sometimes you can calculate the normalization constant and sometimes it's really hard. And um, when you're doing an implicit uh, distribution, you don't even have to worry about it. Um, so an example of an explicit distribution is if Y was a label, you would out output probabilities. Or if Y is an image, you would say the probability of an image. Explicit distributions, you can tell me the actual likelihood of something. I can tell you it's 50% heads and 50% tails, and that from that information, I can create samples of heads and tails if I need to. An implicit distribution, you can generate the data. And you could generate heads and tails samples and find out that, oh, it's generating at 50-50 ratio. But you don't know from the model directly what is the likelihood of a head or a tail, or a cat or a dog, or whatever it is. Um, in some situations, one is more useful. Some situations, one is harder slash impossible. And that's why we have to be full with doing one or the other, depending on uh, what our situation is and how much data we have and everything else. Um, you can recover from implicit to explicit and, imp and explicit to implicit. Um, in terms of explicit to implicit, you can draw your samples and run them through. In terms of implicit to explicit, what you can actually do is try to fit a model to the samples you build, or you can define a distribution that's just a mix of those samples. So implicitly, a set of samples defines a distribution. The distribution is one over n, pick one of the samples. So there are kind of uh, hacky conversions from implicit to explicit um, that will be useful later on as we talk about what to do. Um, so that was just a general covering of what we're trying to do. We're trying to generate samples. We don't care about calculating the likelihood of a sample or anything else. We just want a model that produces images or produces audio or whatever it is and produces it that looks good, that to the observer, it looks like real data. Um, so we're going to compare that with VAEs. Um, can anyone tell me what a VAE is? Who remembers what a VAE is? Did you guys learn VAEs already? Did I lose everybody? Someone's got uh, to yes. their keyboards. <laughs> Various autoencoders. Okay, you guys, you guys learned about VAEs. Did you guys use VAEs? Have you trained a VAE yet, and and made some some data come out yet? We've not we've not trained a VAE for the class, um, but is it's taking some input, uh, distrib some distribution of data, and then creating that distribution, and then 
using with an encoder, it maps out that distribution. And then the decoder um, with some takes that distribution and can map back to the data. But yeah. Okay. And one of the keywords, what is the keyword on what you're actually trying to minimize or your objective function in a, in a VAE? What, what's the, the trick? What is, what is happening that makes it doable? KL divergence between two distributions. Right, right. It's this bound that we place. So I don't know if you guys have gone fully through the math of VAE yet. Um, but hopefully in recitation, if not, or a homework or something along those lines. But when you look at how a VAE is done, there is a step in the math where we do a lower bound. And that means we are, we are defining, here's the thing that we want to optimize. What we want to optimize is we want to generate the data. And then we calculate a bound on how well we're generating the data. And that's actually what we're optimizing. And that there is the difference between a VAE and a GAN. A VAE is minimizing a bound, which makes things much easier. We bound them. There's some math. Maybe you guys can follow the math. Maybe you can't. But when you code it, it's a very simple, here's the objective, run the objective. Your loss goes down, and it, it works pretty much every time. Your GANs are doing an estimate. So a VAE is, let's try to put a bound on this thing. So we have something that's very simple, it's very analytic, it's easy to do, but it's not the thing we want, it's a bound on the thing we want. A GAN is, here's the thing we want, we can calculate an estimate of it, we can approximate it with samples, and we're actually going for what we want, but it's a very noisy, very hard to do, might not quite hit what we want. And in a nutshell, that's how I would describe the difference between GANs and VAEs. And you will see this kind of thing, um, a, a kind of similar trade-off throughout machine learning, no free lunch. But the VAE bound that you guys will implement and hopefully understand is summing the log versus logging the sum or expectation. And that, that change right there gives you something that's not quite what you want. And when you actually train your VAEs, you're going to get something that comes out blurry if we had to just roughly say what happens. Um, so a VAE, it optimizes the bound. It's similar to a typical autoencoder, right? You've got your encoder, you've got your decoder. Encoder goes, here's my, uh, here's my data. Here's my, my real world data, give me a latent representation. Decoder goes, latent representation, give me real data. That's encoder, decoder, autoencoder, et cetera. But the difference is that this Z, this thing that you're encoding it to, is supposed to match a prior. So you've got your regular encoder, and then your Z is trying to be a normal distribution or trying to be whatever. And if your Z exactly matched a normal distribution, then you would have what you want, which is you can encode everything to a normal, decode it from a normal, and you can sample from a normal really easily, so you're fine. So your basic goal is that when you're sampling over your data, you're getting back to a normal distribution. And when you're sampling from a normal distribution, you're getting back to your data. If it's simple, everything works out. Um, both VEs and GANs are trying to make a generative model. And both of them are trying to make this, um, in a VAE, it's called your decoder normally. And in a GAN, it's called your generator. But either way, it's a function. You put a latent data in, that's your normal data or uniform. It's, it's whatever your prior sample is. You put it in and you get images that come out. But the VAE is the bound. It's quick, it's easy, but you don't tend to get where you want. You get a blurrier version because there's the, the stable point of the optimization is just not, it, it's not optimizing what you want it to optimize. And the GAN is sampled, but tends to be much better. It's a, a similar trade-off you'll see where bounds tend to make artifacts and sampling tends to just be harder, but can get you more accurately to where you're trying to go. Um, just generally, 
you will see the vans are faster. So if you're working on something new, my general advice would be to try the VAE first to just get like a sense of your data for generating things. And then you can take kind of similar pieces and make it into a GAN, but um, it's a good, good kind of stepping stone, I think. Um, there are a lot of differences between them. VAEs are clean, analytic. They work really well. GANs are complicated estimators with a bunch of hacks to get them to actually work. But at the end of the day, if you do get your GANs to work, you're going to get a much sharper, much better data than your, your VAEs would have given you. Um, so hopefully you guys get a chance to try one, try the other, and give a little bit of comparison. Anyways, ready to see how they actually work and the math behind them. And we've got an hour to go, so plenty of time. Um, the goal here is to model P of X, as we said, and they're a pair of adversaries. Um, we call them the generator and the discriminator. And unlike any model or anything you guys have trained so far, there's not one thing with one objective, or maybe it's got a couple different objectives, but you can add them together. Um, basically everything you've had so far is add your objectives together. There's one giant loss at the end. There's one optimizer, there's one set of weights, everything gets, gets gradient descended until you get to where you want to go. Uh, now we're dealing with two player and all the complexities that are involved in that. So the first player is the one you know, it's the generator. It's the probability of X, which is your output, given Z, your latent space, producing late, uh, realistic data. Um, the hidden representation, you pump it in, it's from known data, Gaussian, whatever. Your generator is deterministic, but the overall system where you're putting in random data gives you a stochastic uh, overall function. And your generator goes between a known distribution that's simple, something that's low dimensional, something that's a simple manifold, and goes to something that's pixels or a waveform with thousands and thousands of frames. But um, we want, we're trying to simplify and understand a a compact representation. And we hope that if we were to map some really, really complicated thing down to a little ball with 10 dimensions in it, that's going to actually capture some meaningful information about it. We're going to have a big manifold that only covers the real data. Um, what we mean by manifold is basically if you were to imagine the space of all possible pixels. This is a 28 times 28 dimensional space if we're doing grayscale. And if you were to imagine every single image that is a face, that would form a region of the space that, that's lower dimensional than 28 by 28. And it, we're trying to capture just a subset of the space where the faces reside and what, 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 what that looks like and map it down to something simpler. Um, so we have this generator and we're trying to learn this generator, but there's no simple loss function. What we're trying to do is minimize the divergence between what the generator outputs and the real data. So we put Z in, we get X out, that's our generated data. And we've got our real data from our data set and we need to, just minimize the divergence between these two distributions. But there's no loss function that we know of, KL, whatever. We can't use any of those if we don't know what the target distribution is. All I've got is samples from A and samples from B, and I'm trying to minimize the divergence between these two things based only on the samples. And that's where the generator in a GAN is much more complicated than everything else we're dealing with, like a VAE. We can't measure the divergence between a set of samples in a VAE. We make an approximation. That approximation is the average divergence with each sample. And I'll, I'll show the comparison kind of zoomed in in a, a step or two. Um, but what we're going to use is the generator. It's trying to produce this distribution. Samples put it in. Get the yes. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay. So 
what we need is this discriminator. Our discriminator is kind of like a loss function. It's what tells it how to minimize the divergence between what it's producing and what the target data is. And the way it does it is it itself is a neural network. You put data into the generator, it produces this fake generated data. You have a data set of test data, which is real data. Your discriminator tries to tell the difference between the two of them and say, stuff over here is real, stuff over here is fake. The generator then uses that information to say, oh, if I want to look less fake, I'm going to move this way. And that's a play between the two items. The discriminator says, this stuff looks fake for these reasons, and here's the stuff that looks real, and here's how to make it look more real. That's because it learns to label one and the other, and it's a neural network. And because we build the discriminator as a neural network, we can backprop through the discriminator itself. The discriminator is just a function. The function takes pixels and says real and fake. If I have a function that goes from pixels to real and fake, the gradient of that function is how do you make something look more real or more fake? So basically, a neural network itself can be a loss function. We train the neural network to be the loss function to tell the difference. And then that neural network trains the neural network we want to have. Our generator is our end goal. What we want is our generator. And our discriminator is this teacher that's telling it how to be better and fixing it. We don't really want the discriminator, but we need the discriminator to get better and get to where we want to be. Uh, here's it in the diagram. So the random noise goes into the generator to make the fake image, and your training set is your real images. Your discriminator is looking at the real and the fakes, and it's getting them labels as real and fakes as best as it can. And that data can then be back propped to the generator to make the generator closer to real. Uh, these are two processes that are happening at the same time. The discriminator is constantly learning what's the difference between real and fake. And that's because as the generator changes, the difference between real and fake changes. And there is no ideal discriminator as you're training. The ideal discriminator depends on the current generator. If my goal is to produce the number three and my generator is producing ones, then my discriminator should be a positive slope going that way. It, but if my goal is to produce three and my generator is currently producing a five, then my discriminator should be a slope going the other way, saying go that way. So the discriminator changes as the generator changes and the generator learns from the discriminator. And your eventual goal is if the generator and the training data are the exact same distribution and I give you my generated data and I give you my real data and your network can't tell the difference between the two of them, then that means that you're generating good data. And I think that the GAN makes a lot of sense in that abstract sense. Um, just at, at a high level, if the discriminator can't tell the difference between what you're generating and the real data, then you know that you're producing something good. And when you think about it that way, you're thinking about what can the discriminator do? Your discriminator is a neural network. Your discriminator has all of the biases and training and whatever that a neural network has. You have a convolutional discriminator or an LSTM discriminator, whatever that discriminator is. And you're saying if this discriminator can't tell the difference, then I guess it's good enough. I guess I'm doing what I want to do. The discriminator is the proxy for the human being that we wanted. We want a we don't really care about KL, honestly. We don't care about any of these things. We don't want to minimize XYZ divergence. We want to produce images that look good to people. We want to produce audio that sounds like real audio. And maybe this metric's a good metric. Maybe I should minimize L2, maybe minimize L1, I don't know. There are a lot of kind of choices there. Really, you want to make it look like humans can't tell the difference.
our best approximation for a brain is a neural network. And this is really what we're trying to do is if the neural network can't tell the difference, then it can probably fool people. And if it's convolutional, then that means there's some shift in sensitivity. And all of the things that we build into the discriminator are, yeah. So you, you should really think of this discriminator as the proxy for the observer. And if neural networks really are a um, kind of the best we can do at like humans and how they process, then if a discriminator can't tell the difference between two things, then a human probably can't either if the neural network's built correctly. And that's where all the hard work comes in. <coughs> so anyways, that's just a picture. Um, and if you keep the picture in mind, we can get into the actual math. Uh, so in the math, uh, this is the way it's traditionally written. There are so many variations of this uh, formula. There are two-ish that I will call out as the ones that you should really be using when you're, you're building the model for yourself, but we're gonna start with the 2014 GAN. So we'll preface this by, we wanna understand the math and how the original GAN works and how it comes from with the caveat that there are other versions that'll work much better. <laughs> so um, it's a min-max game of, and all these terms here, the G is your generator, your D is your discriminator, your V is your value function, it's, just what you're trying to optimize. It's the thing you're trying to min or max. And our first term here, uh, can you guys see if I highlight things on the screen, by the way? Yeah. Is it, yes. yeah. Okay, Okay. good. That, that'll help you follow along because there's a lot of, I will apologize for the next few pages, uh, trying to get the math out of the way and um, definitely stop with any questions, any thing you want to ask about how the, how the derivations actually actually go in the next slide or two. So uh, our first term is the expectation over x. That's our real data of log discriminator of x. So that is um, the counterpart to what we see over here, which is log of one minus discriminator of something else. Um, when you see this kind of log of d, log of one minus d, that should remind you of uh, binary cross entropy and the formulations we've done for that. But basically you're trying to EX log DX, that is maximize the log, the log probability of something, the log likelihood of D. So here, if we are to break this down, we are trying to maximize over D and minimize over G. So that means the generator is constantly trying to make V small and the discriminator is trying to make V big. So if the discriminator's trying to make V big, then EX log DX is trying to make D as big as possible. So the way you should read that is the discriminator is trying to make positive values for real data. EX log DX, positive values for real data and log of one minus DGZ, if you look at the outer part, log of one minus D, that's a thing where if you want to maximize that value, then you want to make D as small as possible. So if D is really small, then it's log of one. And if D is bigger than, bigger than that, then that's gonna start decreasing and that'll make it smaller. So from the point of view of D, you want to make this term as big as possible and this subterm as small as possible. So from the perspective of the discriminator, what you're trying to do is give big values for real data and give small values for G of Z, G of Z being generating data from your, from your uh, latent variables. So all this is trying to say is label positively your real data, label negatively your fake data, and do it as we usually do with binary cross metropy where you're maximizing the log likelihood of something. Um, so maximize the log likelihood of labeling real data as real, maximize the log likelihood of labeling fake data as fake. If you were to implement this from the sake of the discriminator, that would just be put it into PyTorch binary cross entropy, 
label one for real data, label zero for fake data or negative one, whatever it happens to be in the, the framework you're doing. So it might look a little um, unfamiliar first, but as you start kind of using things like this and you'll see BCE show up a lot and you'll just start to recognize this as you see this formula and you go like, oh, that means binary cross entropy where D of X should be labeled one and D of G of Z should be labeled zero. Um, so D wants to label one and zero and your generator, if we look at the other point of view, minimize with respect to G, minimize with respect to G, this term doesn't matter. It doesn't depend on G, so we don't care about this. But what your generator is trying to do is just the opposite. So G is trying to make DGZ positive and D is trying to make DGZ zero. And this is where they conflict. So if G had its way, G would make this true. And if D had its way, it would make this true. And the two of them need to fight it out and be optimized at the same time and eventually hit this kind of equilibrium where I can't tell the difference, I can't change, everything looks great. So breaking down the, uh, the formulas for each of the players kind of in more detail, um, we're gonna start with the formula from the first, from the previous page, okay? This is your binary cross entropy formulation. If we want to solve first for the discriminator, so we say, what is D of X? If we want to figure out what D of X is at, at uh, the optimum, then we do it the same way we optimize anything else, which is do the derivative and then solve. So first we take this formula, you say, this has a E of X here, and this has an E of X from a different distribution here. And expectation can be rewritten as a integral. So the expectation over X is the same thing as integrating over X, the probability of X. So expectation over X PD is the same as the integral over PD and then the same term. Expectation over X PG is the same as integrating over PG and that term gets copied here. What that allows us to do is we can actually combine those two integrals because we've got two things that are integrating over X. So instead of having this integral over X plus this integral over X, we just have this integral over X of A plus B. So the first step here is rewrite the expectations as the integrals and then combine the integrals. Um, does anyone have any questions about how to get from line one to line two? Okay, that sounds good. So the reason we're breaking this out into line one and line two, um, your discriminator is a neural network. So we're gonna assume the neural network can uh, give a different value for each X. In this form, in this uh, proof, we're just gonna assume our neural network's got as many neurons as it possibly wants to have. And it can output any images at once and it can output any value for any input image, whatever it wants. There are no constraints on it whatsoever. And if that's the case, then if we want to minimize this integral and we say PD of X is independent for every X and D of X is independent for every X. I mean, really what matters is D of X is independent for every X. So if we say the discriminator is an ultimate discriminator, then what that lets us do is say this entire thing, I just need to optimize it for each X. It's an integral over X and I want to minimize it. I want to maximize it, whatever. If every single point on X is independent, then all I need to do is optimize each and every point. So what we're going to do is we kind of toss out the, uh, the integral and the DX. And what we need to do is we need to optimize this inner term right here. So we optimize this inner term right here by taking the derivative of it. 
So what we see right here on the next line is taking the derivative. So log d of x, we're taking the derivative with respect to d of x. So our goal here is to find the optimal discriminator. And the way we do that is take the derivative of the function with respect to the discriminator, set it to zero, solve, what do we get? So we take the derivative of this term with respect to d of x, and that gives us p d of x does not depend on d of x, so that term stays there. And the derivative of log d of x gives us 1 over d of x. For the second term, we're going to do this derivative. So the derivative of p g of x with respect to d of x is, that doesn't change anything, that's just our leading term. And the derivative here is 1 over 1 minus d of x. And because it has a negative here, then the derivative gets a leading term of a negative. So if we take this chunk right here, ignoring the, uh, the integral and the dx at the end, and then we take the derivative of that, we get this formula and we set it to 0. The integral is thrown out because d of x is the discriminator. It's the discriminator is a function which takes in an input and gives you a label for every single pixel, like uh, for every image, let's say. We're integrating over x and we're imagining that this neural network is independent of every x. So if this neural network can um, give a different label for every single image and we're integrating over images, then we just need to optimize for every single individual image. So it's like if, um, basically it's, it's uh, the sum of independent terms and the, if, if you really wanted to get into the proof, it would just, I mean, not that anyone gets into the actual uh, uh, modus ponens or whatever of it all, but um, it's a summation, you're, you're, you're maximizing a integral, which is kind of like a summation, think of it. And if every single term in that summation is independent, then you can just maximize every single independent term. If you're maximizing the sum of a bunch of dependent terms, then I don't know if doing this over here is going to raise that term more than that term over there. But maximum over sum is the same thing of maximizing each of the independent pieces, as long as you can break them out that way. So that key assumption is that just that d of x is really powerful. And this is not a fair assumption, and it's going to be wrong in every single situation. Because you're never going to have a neural network that can give um, any label to any value because it's a neural network and things are smooth and it's like if it gives a one to this guy it can't give a zero to the thing 0 0.0001 next to it so it's not really a fair assumption but um, if we do treat it as every single point then this is what happens so yeah um, so the optimization at the end what what this formula says d of x that is d for a given x. And if we were to define a discriminator that was this function for every single x, then that would be the discriminator we need. Um, so this last step here is pretty straightforward. This is the algebra. But this negative term, you move it over. You uh, multiply the terms out a little bit, do a little rearrangement. Hopefully following that part pretty straightforwardly. but this is the uh, what happens when you move it over. So when all said is done, your optimal discriminator, the discriminator that is going to get the minimum for this thing, is the probability of something under the real data set divided by the probability under the generated data set plus the probability of the real data set. So Real probability over real plus fake probability is what your discriminator wants to do. So that means if it is only going to happen in your real data set, then PD is 1, PG is 0. That would give you 1 over 1 for real data. And if, if, if X is only in the real set and never in the fake set, then it should give it a 1. If X is only in the fake set and not in the real set, then it would be 0 over 0, or 0 over 1 plus 0. Uh, 
and it should give a zero for data that is only in the fake set. If data, if, if this face is equally likely under real and fake data, then D of X should be what? One half. Point five. Yep. And that is your goal is this is equally likely under either set. I don't know what it is. Your discriminator says 0. 0.5. Like, I have no idea. Flip a coin. Maybe it's real. Maybe it's fake. And that's your likelihood ratio. Your discriminator is outputting your likelihood ratio. When you look at your discriminator, do you know what PD is? Can you recover PD or PX or PG from your discriminator value? There's, there's no way to pull that back. Yeah, it's, it's the likelihood ratio. And this is why it becomes feasible. You can't learn PD of X. You can't learn PG of X. It's complicated. You can't normalize it. It's the likelihood of a face. That's ridiculously complicated. But what you can do is you can learn the ratio between likelihoods of different data sets. And that's what lets our discriminator actually work. So we're going to take that piece of the discriminator and see what happens when we plug it into the, uh, actually, sorry, there's one more step, which is when we look at, um, that's what the discriminator should output. So we've solved for what D of X is. And now if we solve for what is V under D of X, we, we take that D of X and we plug it back into our original equation. And, um, what that's going to give us actually comes down to a Jensen chain and divergence. And if you guys know what JSD is, that is the KL between A and the average of A and B and the plus half the KL of B between the average of A and B. So it gives you a, um, it gives you a measure of divergence and your value the, the once your discriminator has fully trained, the V that you have is your Jensen chain of divergence. It's simple and it's meaningful. But before your discriminator is finished training, you don't actually have that. Um, so the way we're going to do this is you just this this line right here is your original uh, V. That's the big equation from the first slide. And we plug in this part right here into D of X and we plug this part right here into D of X. And the reason we have this thing that looks like this instead of one minus is just a little bit of fraction of like one minus PD over G of, uh, I'm sorry, one of these, this should be D over G plus D and G plus D. Uh, it's a minor error, but yeah, obviously plugging in the original one. Um, but anyways, plugging that in is actually one half of the KL. Uh, so PD over PG plus PD, we define PD plus PG over two as M. So we create a new distribution, which is half of one and half of the other. And that new distribution, we plug in, we rewrite this as the new distribution. And it's actually KL between discriminator and the generator and this M, which is your mixed distribution. Um, so it's a little weird, but JSD is always the, uh, the mixed distribution, the difference between those two. So now that we have that piece behind, if we know that V, I mean, that's, that's a lot of stuff boiling it down, but if this is what V is equal to, and we've already taken the discriminator out. We've done the discriminator minimization or maximization. And now we just take this and we minimize G. What's the thing that minimizes G in this case? It's the thing where the JSD is minimal. So all said and done, your generator is minimizing the divergence between the generated data and the real data. Um, what we've just shown is that there is a stationary point. I can give you this formula 
several pages back and you can take that formula and go, this formula proves I am minimizing the Jensen chain of divergence and here's where the minimum is and that's where I should be able to optimize to. At that minimal, at that ideal point, generated data matches the real data, 0.5 outputs for everything, the gradient's flat, nothing moves, you're all good. The trick is the stationary point is not a stable point. And there's a difference between stationary and stable. Um, if you optimize something and you find a gradient setting equal to zero, then you know that is a minimum, that is a maximum, or maybe it's a saddle point, depending on what you're doing. But you know that is a point where things can balance. That does not mean that things want to balance there. Um, a good example is something like a pencil. If you try to balance a pencil on its point, a pencil has a stationary point. There is a position of the pencil that there is zero net, net movement anywhere. There's zero acceleration. It just stays there on its point. But if the pencil is slightly to the left, it will accelerate to the left. If the pencil is slightly to the right, it will accelerate to the right. There is a stationary point, but around the stationary point, things don't move towards the stationary point, they move away from it. So if you were to graph, here's where the stationary point is, and you were to graph the movement of things, it would all go away from the point. But in ideal optimization problems, we want things to be going towards the stationary point. If something's like, uh, you know, one of those, those bouncing, um, you know, little, little boxing rubber dummies. If you knock them anywhere off from center, they actually want to go back towards center, not the other way. Um, so we do have that issue when training GANs. And that's where a lot of our tricks will come into it next week. Um, the hard part is that they're simultaneously training. And you need to do a lot of tips and tricks to make sure you don't overtrain, undertrain, cause various issues with kind of um, if the generator gets trained too fast, things won't work. If the discriminator gets trained too fast, things won't work. It's this kind of tug of war and they both need to be relatively balanced. And if one is too much stronger than the other, then your results will just be junk. And that's a good comparison with VAEs where with VAEs, you're always going to get data. It's always going to optimize. It just might be blurry sometimes. With a generator, you might get nothing that looks like a face at all. Um, the reason for that is kind of on, on the side of the generator. If the discriminator is not doing what it's doing correctly and it's not separating things correctly and you train the generator using it, then you're actually getting worse. If the, if the discriminator was to label real data is fake and fake data is real and you train using that, then you're making your stuff worse. Versus the discriminator can't overtrain. If the discriminator tries to separate things and keeps training to separate things, then it will overlearn. So your discriminator is a function that you are using for your loss. It is a, um, like, uh, sorry, just saw that question, I'll get that in a second. Um, so it is a function that's calculating loss and it's going through a sigmoid or something. And the more and more you train it, the larger and larger the weights go, the more that loss becomes saturated. And then when you try to use it, the gradient's actually nothing. So it's kind of like if you gave test problems that were too hard. Like I need to tell the difference between uh, people who know really advanced math and people who don't. And I have a really, really complicated test for it. You can't like slowly get better on that test until you look like the, the ones that are doing correctly. Um, so there is a balance between a discriminator that tells the difference, but not too sharply, and the generator starting to learn it. And then as the generator gets better, the discriminator gets more complicated and um, establishing that trade. Ben, there's a question on chat. Yeah. So the architecture search for the generator and the discriminator. Um, in terms of in terms of the architectures, we can give you many examples of different architectures people have tried, regular 
what you would do with a neural network. It's just that the architecture search becomes much more complicated. Um, in terms of number one, the evaluation is harder. Um, I will go through a part later where we talk about how to actually evaluate your models so that you can say this one did better than the other because even being able to tell what's better or worse when you're doing generated is harder. Um, and then you're doing a architectural search on both the generator and the discriminator. And that part is somewhat of a um, much more of an art than a science, although there are hacks and steps that make it easier in the sense that if you have a very, very complicated, deep discriminator network, then you have a neural network that can tell the difference between all types of things. So your generator is going to come out sharper, right? But you're giving it something much more complicated and that much more complicated thing might be harder to learn from. Um, so there are a lot of, uh, I'm just gonna call them hacks or tricks or models or whatever you call it, of things like uh, progressively growing discriminators is actually one of the first examples I showed you. Um, but what the model actually does is do a small discriminator and a bigger discriminator and you train your generator to first be able to pass this guy. But then once you're able to fool this guy, then you bring in a much more complicated neural network that can tell more differences and try to fool that guy. Um, so the architecture search, um, it's not just even one discriminator, so stacks of discriminators, but the search is hard with just kind of having to eyeball in a lot of sense of, oh, maybe my discriminator is too complicated or maybe it's not complicated enough. Um, is my generator complicated enough? Are they too out of match? Um, so I see a question for your loss. What else can you do to know how your generator is doing? Um, yeah, you can eyeball the results. Yeah, uh, actually great question. I think, yeah, gain, gain evaluation. If you, if you look at the second to the last in the upper right. So if we get down to that in the next 15, 20 minutes, then you will know all about that. Um, hi, so I've got a couple of videos. Yes? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Like, can you not have a pre-trained uh, discriminator already and you just don't train it and but use it for your training of the generator? <clears throat> right. You would, you would hope you could do that. And there are, like, to a certain extent, there are some things that kind of work. But in general, um, no, because what the discriminator you want is changes based on the generator. Um, and I mentioned just like a really simple example. Um, just imagine you're like outputting a single number and it's like my data set is a bunch of threes, okay? And my real data is a bunch of ones. Then you're, I, there, there's a class of ideal generators, of ideal discriminators, but those discriminators would put one really low and three really high. So it'd be a function looking like that. But if I was producing, let's say fives, then I would want to make them lower and the ideal discriminator would be going that way. And if you imagined a discriminator, which was just a bump at three, like I want to make threes, therefore I'm just going to do this, then that's really hard to optimize. Because if you had a discriminator, that's just a point at this data is real and nothing else counts, then the gradient you've got over here is like non-existent. Um, so that's kind of the idea. And it, it, it goes back to what I was just saying actually about the, um, the, the, the overtraining a little bit. But if you overtrain something, the discriminator, which would might be your ideal discriminator, if you could beat that discriminator, then you would, it would be correct. But that discriminator would have to be so sharp at such right points, then you're not gonna, it's not gonna hit it. Um, the other reason that doesn't work is your discriminator doesn't have to be complicated enough to rule out every single possible wrong face because the space of wrong faces is gigantic. So if your discriminator wants to tell true for real faces and fake for generated faces, it's like separate these two groups. 
if you're trying to say true for real faces and fake for every single possible image that's not a face, that itself is gigantic space you can't sample from. You couldn't train a network to say all faces to all non-faces because then you'd have to have a data set of every single image that's not a face and that's not feasible. I can make a data set of faces and fake faces, but data set of faces and every non-face would be, yeah, it wouldn't be something we could do. And that's why we have to train this discriminator to tell the difference between just these two things. And if things change, there might be a different distance. So it's kind of like your teacher is not giving you all of the feedback to everything at once. It's like, what are you doing? What are you doing wrong? Go that way. You make some changes. Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing wrong? Go that way. So you can get away with a smaller discriminator. Your discriminator only needs to tell the current problem. It doesn't need to be big enough to capture every single possible mistake you could possibly make. Yeah, okay. Um, so in terms of the stability question, uh, this is kind of how you can graph the, uh, my pencil metaphor. Um, this is from a paper that we will get into deep, deeply later on the stability of GANs, but you will see that some GANs, especially like the standard GAN, you see there are no arrows in the center, that's your stable point, but the arrows don't point towards that point. And different variations on GAN can cause different um, variations on it where the arrows actually will leave you there. So stability is the question of whether the arrows get you to the center and stationary point is the question of whether there is a center that exists. And just the fact that you can optimize something on paper doesn't mean that when you actually do the optimization, it gets there. So um, one of the really fascinating things that I touched on is the idea of perceptual distance. This is everything we do in our discriminator impacts how our generator trains. So the more our discriminator isn't L1 loss, it isn't L2 loss. As a human being, you don't say, oh, this image of a dog and this image of a dog are similar because their L1 is low. Like that's, that's ridiculous. You have two images that are shifted a little bit and the L1 is really, really high, but you and I would be like, oh no, that's clearly a dog. There's no way for us to do a L1 loss that you could plug into PyTorch that says this and that are just shifted a little bit. That's very complicated, it's very hard to do. With a GAN, we're just capturing, can this network tell the difference? And if that network has some shift in variance, if that network does this, that, or the other, just the way people do, everything we're trying to do about CNNs and ResNets, all of those biases and learning get captured in our, our loss. So we're trying to make things that are perceptually similar, not just L1, L2, whatever you've been doing. It's not really the KL loss that it's learning. Uh, we did the proof and said it's, oh, JSD, it's, it's minimizing. It's not. It's not an ideal network. It can't do a different X at every single point. It's learning the best approximation to the KL loss that a neural network can learn, meaning it's learning something that's kind of squiggly like the KL but it's also got this shift invariance thing or whatever else the neural network adds to it. Um, so the good is great results, looks crisp. Bad is stability problems that I've briefly touched on. And the ugly is there are a lot of things you can do that actually make it work. It's just more complicated to actually train. Um, so to kind of understand the difference between GANs and VAEs, I just want to drill this thing in, is if you have a VAE and half the time it encodes here and half the time it encodes here, the VAE is going to have infinite loss, but the GAN, a GAN can model that. And the reason for that is this kind of uh, description of it is really these last two lines. So with a VAE, you're doing this the slower bound, the bound is the average divergence 
between each conditional. So you have encodings of cats, encodings of dogs, and the average divergence between encodings of cats and encodings of dogs and the prior that you want. That is the lower bound on what the GAN is calculating, which is the divergence between the marginal and the prior. So to kind of visualize that, if you've got only two things in your data set that are going into your VAE and it's producing two different encodings for them, your VAE is minimizing the KL between this encoding and your prior, the full circle, and this encoding and the full circle, and averaging those two divergences together, the GAN is calculating the divergence between these two things together and what you want it to be. So your GAN is calculating the full, does my marginal distribution over my latent equal what I want it to be? And the VAE is saying, is the average distribution over my, or no, sorry, is the average divergence of conditional distributions close to what I want it to be? That, that's a big difference right there. So what that brings us to is GAN evaluations, which you guys have mentioned a few times in the questions. So uh, definitely ask all your questions here, but um, the goal is to make realistic looking images. And it's not really that easy to evaluate it and to start off with the basics, human evaluations, that's an important part of a lot of studies. Um, definitely your last step, but that is your ultimate question. Your ultimate evaluation, if you have the time and the budget and the Turkers, is to say, I made 300 GAN outputs of death metal and I got 100 real death metal songs and I had people listen to a bunch of them and say which ones they liked the best and mine got rated as high as the real ones. That type of thing is really the end goal what you want, but that's hard to do. Um, a simpler way to do this, uh, or not simpler, it takes a lot of uh, calculation, but a, uh, a way to do that doesn't involve humans at least, is to try to calculate the test set likelihood. So that is the, uh, the validation metric you do on pretty much any other model. Your standard metric for any model, if you can do it, is the log likelihood. It's how likely is my data. It's the easiest way to describe anything you're doing. If your real data has got an average high likelihood, then that means you know what to expect. And if some data has a really low log likelihood, then that means this was unexpected and you can't and your model is not so good. So how do we calculate the log likelihood? I said it's a implicit distribution. You can get to get samples and to get an explicit distribution or an explicit distribution is what can calculate the actual likelihood. So you can hack together a real, a, a analytic distribution, an explicit distribution from a uh, an implicit distribution. So for example, let's say I was to just generate a million images and then say, I declare a Gaussian mixture model and here are my 10 million points. That is a model that I can calculate. If you give me a million Gaussians, it's a, compli it's a complicated calculation, but I can tell you what the log likelihood of a specific pixel is or a specific point is from a million different Gaussians or a million different softmaxes. But what that really requires is generating uh, data points. So basically if I have a implicit model that can generate data and I wanna say, what's the likelihood of this picture right here, I can generate trillions of images. And if five of the images are this image that I wanted, then five out of a trillion is the likelihood-ish. So your approximate likelihood can just be from sampling, but based on the size of your data set and the complexity of what you're actually trying to hit, it can be good, it can be bad, it can be accurate, it could be not. So basically, if you generate data and then you declare a mixture model, which just means a bunch of different distributions added together, 
and you just say each one of these samples that my data generates, I'm just going to call that one block of distribution, add them all together. And then here's a distribution that I can, it's a Gaussian, whatever. So you'll just say, I'm going to put a Gaussian around everything that I generated. And then these Gaussians I can actually calculate. Um, so that works. It does give you an actual metric, but when I'm saying you need to calculate a million images, I do mean a million images. So in terms of computation, um, you need to generate a lot of data to randomly hit the data point you want. Because what this is basically saying is, if you want to know what the likelihood of my face is, you just need to generate data from your model until it comes out with my face and then see how many times it didn't. And that, that's a fraction, that's a probability. But when you think of it that way, you can imagine how many faces you have to generate before you randomly pull one out that matches. Uh, quick um, question. Yes. I just want to make sure that I understand it well. So you're saying basically we can take, let's say images and then um, let's say our model predicts uh, certain points and then the real images has uh, other rows and then whatever where they match is where we that, that's our likelihood is that is that what you're saying yeah your, your model outputs images and your so you train your model on a training data set and yes. then you take your model that you've trained and you generate out millions of images whatever it is and uh -huh. then you say how many of those images, like for Match each item the in the train data, yeah, then, then it, go through the test data set and say, this is this item in the test data set, how many times did it match? So relatively easy if you're talking MNIST and binary pixels, et cetera, you don't have to generate that many images. But if you have a 512 by 512 full color image of something and you're trying to say, what's the likelihood of me pumping that out of my model and it's it's complicated data set you might never generate enough images to get a good example yeah so uh, i i think i'm a bit confused cuz i'm thinking what if um, so let's say what if each of your points range between let's say 0 to like a trillion and then you have so many points like what are the odds of you actually hitting one point at any point in time like exactly how would you, you blur it a little bit you'll do things like if i'm generating a pixel i'm going to put a gaussian around the pixel that i generate just to give it a little blur factor things like that but on larger data sets and more complicated samples this is no longer a feasible um a feasible uh, strategy for testing. So that would bring us to things like uh, the, the third kind of evaluation we're talking about. Um, but yeah, you basically hit, yeah, it, it can work. And when you're talking with large GPUs, if I want to generate 10 million MNIST samples, I can do that in a couple minutes. It's not too bad. But um, the accuracy of this method just depends on the, the size of your data set or the the size of the space really and like how big the manifold is in there so yeah it, it is feasible it's been done a lot of times but only on the smaller data sets once you start going 512 by 512 by three you can't do anything with that um, another thing you can do is to evaluate with a different discriminative network um, and that is i remember someone mentioned earlier why can't you just use a like ideal discriminator that you just train once. And you can't do that because you won't train well against it. But if you did have something that was like an ideal discriminator, you could definitely use it for your evaluation. So you can do evaluations using other discriminators and using proxies for discriminators. You can also do it um, based on matching uh, metrics and things like that against real data sets. So one example of that is called the inception score. Um, what that does is you take a network and this has to be trained for a different reason. Um, the problem is if you just take a discriminator and you train against that discriminator, you eventually completely beat it, but still get something that's junky. And that's what happens unless your discriminator is constantly updated. 
but kind of like how we do validation sets if you have a validation discriminator that you've never seen before your performance on that can tell you how well your network is doing so what we have here is the inception score your inception metric um your inception network is just a big standard network and it tells you things like this is a car this is a duck whatever um and you say this is something that my model's not been looking at but if i point this at my model i should get 10 percent ducks and 10 percent cows or whatever my data is supposed to have so by the fact that an unrelated untainted network that's meant to identify images or a, like an ASR system, whatever it is, let's say you're doing audio generation and you just want to generate audio, you could train your audio system and evaluate it by taking your generated audio, putting it into an ASR system and seeing if it comes out with like valid English. That would be a way of having a very fair um, way of, of evaluating it, it may not necessarily hit every single point of evaluation that you want to have but it does give you some indication that yeah you know if if, if i'm generating waveforms and those waveforms get parsed into english or they get recognized as cows or whatever it is by this other model that hasn't been messed with before then I, i'm probably doing pretty well and if this data set when i put it into inception everything gets labeled as a cow then I'm probably not generating good data. So in terms of a feasible method that you can actually do, something like this is very reasonable, but it doesn't give you a negative law of likelihood. It doesn't necessarily tell you how well you're doing, but it, it gives you something that you can put in a graph and compare things with. So does this method uh, make sense to you? Uh, I have a small question. Sure. So for the for, for the part, um, like you said, you can take a model and then uh, you train it to classify on actual real data, and then take your generator and then you see uh, you 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 basically test it to your other classifier. So with the first classifier, does it need to be an actual neural network, or can you just use? any classifier that you want and then you check anything you want to test from that with. point on yeah and, and so it doesn't matter with that yeah and it could also be something more complicated or something off the shelf or whatever it is um in terms of the thing called inception score it's a very specific thing but in terms of how you can evaluate neural networks that are generating data um the general idea is take another neural network that's not been tainted you haven't been directly training on that and trying to fool that one and see if it treats it like regular data. If, if, if you've got a categorizer and you run it on it, then it should categorize things relatively the same. Or if you have ASR, it should give you English. Or if you have w whatever XYZ other model that's you know from anywhere else in the class that does something with your data, see if it does the same thing with your data that it does with the real data and then you probably got a, a good system. So whatever it is, <laughs> if it's identification and object location, whatever it is, just put it through this other model and put your real data through the other model and say both of them gave, you know, average bounding boxes this size. Both of them gave whatever it is, figure out a metric that compares that in some way. The, the specifics of inception is just a kind of co more complicated entropy measurement, but it's saying, yes, everyone, it should label everything and it should label everything with high confidence. So you put it into a image recognition program, it should give you cats and it should give you dogs and it shouldn't give you a bunch of things that say, maybe it's a cat, maybe it's a dog. Because if your inception network is confused about what the picture is and your inception network works really well on real data, then that means your fake data is probably not that good. So, so, so basically, if let's say we, we have like a classifier that's classifying, let's say, four different types of images, and then even from your generating data, it's classifying them among the four confidently, then we know it's kind of good. Yeah, you hope it's kind of good. It could be doing something else and maybe putting in more metrics is better. <laughs> but in terms of architecture search, you want to 
run 10 different dimensions and five different numbers of layers and have a graph of which one's the best, then that's a thing you could graph, which probably indicates what you want. The thing you actually want to train or like the metric you want, like I said, the metric you always want, well, really, the metric you want is this one, the human evaluation, but obviously that's not feasible. The general metric you want is this P of X, like the actual log likelihood, because that's, I know what that means. I can interpret that. I can give you all the stats of what that means and tell you what this, yeah, you, I know what log likelihood is versus inception score, that kind of thing. You can give a number, but I can't say that like, like I, I can't translate it into a percent correct or anything really directly interpretable. It's just, this is better, that is worse. So that hits exactly 920, which I think is a good point to stop. That tells you how to evaluate the GANs. And um, I guess I'll just skip ahead to what's next, which is we're gonna talk a lot about um, a couple of variations of GANs, which can give you uh, just better results and let you do more complicated things like how do you go from a zebra to a horse, horse to zebra, Monet to photo, photo to Monet. Um, we just talked about how a GAN can generate data, but we're going to talk how it can conditionally generate data and categorize data and do other things. And then the big part for next week is going to be called WGAN GP. But basically, how do we change this function so that it actually trains and we can code it and it, it works well? There's one question, Ben. Chris has his hands up. Oh. All right. Uh, hi, Ben. Thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, I, so I, was, I had two questions. Uh, the first is with respect to the choice of a data set. I was wondering if you had any thoughts or um, anything to share concerning observations on how the choice of a data set has improved the performance of a GAN, and particularly because you mentioned that the labels are binary and you need to choose real versus fake. So what exactly cut, um, what exactly would be an appropriate uh, fake uh, distribution or choice of uh, so the... representations in a data set? And then the second question is, I was wondering if perhaps in the next lecture, you'd maybe give some insights on um, the use of GANs in text generation. Mm, okay. Um, GANs and text generation are lots of fun. Uh, for your first question, the, the fake data is being generated live from your generator. So you've got your generator, you're trying to, to train it to produce real data. Whatever it's currently producing, you're calling fake. Mm -hmm. And each iteration, each epoch, you're generating new fake data. And that means your fake data is slowly looking more and more real as you're training it. And that's why you need to do things like back and forth at the same time. It's like, if you're trying to draw a face, you start with like some circles and some lines and you know, you're outside the lines, whatever, and you got some minor modifications and you need someone that can tell the difference between this bad face and the real face. But then as the faces start getting better, that discriminator is gonna start looking for tinier changes. And this little shift over here, like. If you were to imagine an art teacher telling you how to draw a face, they would start with like, use the pointy part of the pencil, you know, and then they would end up with like, oh, you should do some more shading under the, the nose right there to make sure it's accurate. So the discriminator might start to look at this or do something different as the generator is slowly learning. Um, okay. In terms that, of- That makes more sense now. Yeah, in terms of text generation, um, there are, two methods we can flip through really quickly. Um, one interesting hack for text generation that we can just briefly show is the AA, which is nice. So with a GAN, you want to have a loss function that's your discriminator. That's a neural network that takes in whatever your outputs are and gives you good or bad. So if what it's taking in is text, if your input to your GAN, or sorry, if your input to your discriminator is uh, categorical in some way, then you've got a function that you can't backprop through, right? So if it takes in lists of symbols, then I can't backprop through the list of symbols the same way I can backprop through a pixel. 
So you can still train your discriminator, but then instead of doing back prop, you have to do reinforcement learning style. So what that means is if you train a discriminator on text to tell good text or bad text, then that will tell you what good and bad text is and how to get better, except you can't gradient descent it. You could try different versions of text and see which ones do better on the discriminator. And then that's an RL approach to things. The other approach you can do is called an adversarial autoencoder. Um, these adversarial autoencoders are very similar to VAEs, but they fix a lot of the problems with them. An adversarial autoencoder, I'd say, is like halfway between. Um, it's a lot better than VAE in a lot of ways. It's pretty easy to train, a lot easier than a GAN, but it doesn't give you quite as sharp results as a GAN would give you. Um, what an AAE is, is you take a regular autoencoder and you got image goes in, or sorry, you got text goes in, you get a normal distribution, whatever, and then text comes back out. But instead of a VAE, meaning that this is KL average over conditionals and all of that lower bound thing, you do a discriminator. And what you're saying is samples from my latent distribution should match samples from my real distribution, but here your real distribution is a normal distribution or whatever. Okay. So the part that you're switching out is you imagine your VAE, but instead of KL loss saying your latent should look like a, a normal distribution, you're using a discriminator and your discriminator is saying your latent distribution should look like uniform or whatever you want it to be. So you're swapping out that part, and that means your discriminator in a GAN is working on the outputs. Your discriminator in an AAE is working on the latent variables. So it takes the, the entire VAE architecture and goes, instead of doing this lower bound, we're gonna swap that out with a discriminator that's gonna calculate the actual value you want. It just gonna take a lot of samples and a lot of, yeah, <laughs> a lot of samples and fine tuning to actually get to where you want it to be. So right. in terms of doing text generation with GANs, your two choices would be adversarial autoencoder. So your inputs and your outputs are still soft maxes and whatever. And those are all categorical, but your latent distribution can be continuous. So what, what AEs let you do is if your inputs and outputs are discrete, but you map them to something continuous in the middle, you can then use the discriminator on the continuous part and that's easy. If you do the discriminator on the actual text, if you were trying to do a regular GAN where you're discriminating text or whatever categorical stuff, you need to do generator updates using reinforcement learning. So your generator randomly outputs this and randomly outputs that. And if this one scored higher than that one, then it makes this one more likely than that one. So both mm -hmm. those, yeah, both work, a little complicated, but the general idea is there. Um, in terms of is the discriminator just a classifier? Uh, yeah, the discriminator just says, this is real, this is fake you imagine anything that could do a binary categorization on images of cats and dogs and basically just do that network, except instead of cats versus dogs, you're outputting real versus fake. And in terms of output and training, when we went back to the, uh, the formulation, it really is just do your regular output linear, put it into a sigmoid, but don't really, because it's log sigmoid, whatever but it's binary cross entropy, all the standard classification stuff you'd want to do. And knowing that it's just a binary classifier in the original model, there are many variations where, yeah, let's say this is binary cross entropy. What happens if I do max margin? What happens if I do X, Y, Z? So there are variations of it that are not quite binary, just your regular old binary cross entropy classifiers, but in, in this sense, they all just give, this is real, this is fake. And if you know what real and fake is, then you can 
start making yourself more real or yeah. Thanks for all the questions.